Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome, everyone. Please remember that you can ask questions at any point during the presentation in the question and answer box on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. I'll be responsible for triaging your questions during the presentation, and we'll address them to the panelists at the end of the presentation. It's my great pleasure to introduce David Becker, Chair of the Credentialing Task Force and Director of Point of View in Australia. Joining him on, the, on this presentation is Dr. Judith Hale, psychometric expert and credentialing consultant to the IALD. I'll now turn the floor over to them. David? Thanks, Jen, and thanks, everybody, uh, for joining in to this uh, ILD webinar. Um, I'm a light designer. I'm based in Australia, as, as Jen says, and uh, I'm a member of the ILD. And um, uh, in 2010, I was invited to, to chair um, originally a, a task force charged with uh, the task of uh, looking into a feasibility of a credential for architectural light designers. I hope uh, uh, that this, uh, this little session will be informative and um, uh, give you an update as to where we are in this process. Now, many people who are logged on today will, will already be members of the ILD and will, will understand its, uh, uh, its methods and its intent. Um, but uh, I think maybe it's worth just giving a quick overview for others. And I'll just outline some key characteristics about the organization. It's a global organization of architectural lighting designers, and it's dedicated to the concerns of independent <coughs> lighting designers as part of setting global standards. Uh, it's governed by a board of uh, 11 directors uh, with members from six countries. Directors uh, uh, operate out of Mexico, Tokyo, Germany, Australia, the UK, and the United States of America. And um, the president is uh, Kevin Theobald, who is, uh, is from the UK. Uh, there are currently more than 900 members uh, from four, 42 countries, so it's, um, it's truly international. But notwithstanding, the ILD does want to build membership by promoting values of lighting design, and, um, and it's hoped that, that uh, a credential will reinforce the value that lighting design brings to, uh, to people and projects. So the mission of the ILD is to serve its worldwide membership by promoting the visible success of members in practicing lighting design. And the vision is to create a, a better world through leadership and excellence in lighting design. And as part of, its, uh, part of its vision and leadership responsibility, the ILD believes it must look forward to try and steer the profession to um, protect its members where it sees possible difficulties or, or where risks might lie ahead. As part of the ILD's vision and, and uh, undertaking to leadership, it created a strategic priority to, um, to explore a professional credential or uh, certification to, uh, in lighting design because it perceives that this will be um, vital in the future. And here's just a, 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 an overview of, of where we, uh, of its efforts to date. In uh, mid-2010, the board uh, of directors formed a credentialing task force, and uh, that task force comprised of uh, Barbara, Barbara Horton, who's uh, president-elect, uh, Rosemary Allaire, David Gatan, Patrick Galigos, Victor Palacio, Charles Thompson, and um, uh, we, were very, uh, we were very pleased to have PLDA uh, as part of the, the task force. Uh, represented by Glenn Schrum, and um, Professor Heinrich Kramer has also participated in, in the process, and we've had input from Robert Sillick, representing NCQLP. The, um, the, the feasibility was really a, a two-year assessment and consultation process involving uh, uh, presentations and questionnaires, webinars like this, uh, representations, straw models, what have you. The questionnaires that were uh, posted went to 36 countries, and there were 637 people.
people that participate in those. So it was very uh, inclusive and um, comprehensive. The task force then um, made some recommendations in, in mid-2012. And right now, we are testing uh, the credential against alpha and beta groups um, across the globe in order to uh, test the application instructions and the assumptions. Now, I'm going to hand the next couple of slides over to Judy. Uh, okay. Judy's going to talk you through these, and, um, and then I will come back um, to talk about the credentials in more detail later on. Uh, thank you, David, and uh, I appreciate everyone joining us today. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about the types of credentials because we've learned, uh, as we've done these sessions in the past, David and I have learned, there's some confusion about what is a certification. First of all, there are certificate programs, and these are pieces of paper that are given to people when they complete some educational event. And it's strictly tied to completion of that. It, the, the educational event may or may not have a test, but the point is you take a class, you take a workshop, attend an academic program, and you get a certificate. That's not what we're talking about. Then there's accreditation. Accreditation is another type of credential, but this credential is bestowed to individuals. Excuse me, it's bestowed to organizations, not individuals. So you accredit schools, you accredit institutions, you accredit programs, but you do not accredit people. And you get that accreditation because you have uh, your program or your institution has demonstrated that it has met some standards. Licensure is another type of credential. What's different about like, licensure is that it's mandatory. Uh, it, 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 you may not practice your work unless you are licensed. Uh, licenses are also given by government agencies, uh, and uh, there may be standards. Most licensures are tied to a test, a knowledge test. You know it as a multiple choice test. And but the important thing is, if you have licensure, it's uh, it's mandatory. It's required. You cannot practice without it. We're not talking about that either. What we're talking about is a certification. A certification is voluntary. It definitely has standards. So people uh, are, are, are able to earn that certification because they can demonstrate through their work that they have accomplished uh, some particular standards. Uh, David, would you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. There's also confusion over a certification and professional membership, uh, particularly with IALD and PLDA. Those organizations, and perhaps others, offer what they call a professional membership. And you become a professional member because you're, you submit a portfolio of products that goes through a peer review. And in IALD's case, you must also have a business model uh, that defines you or sets you apart. The important thing about professional membership, it is a peer review, but, it, but the criteria that the, you're being judged against was not established through a formal study. We call it as a job task analysis. Certification, the standards that we have, were derived from a study. Uh, David alluded to that when he talked about the questionnaire and things like that. But we did a job analysis. We brought people in from all over the world. We even polled a much larger group, and then we went out with a larger survey to actually identify what we call standards or domains of practice. David will define those, explain those to you in just a minute. But those domains then derive some criteria. In other words, what must be present or absent in your portfolio that uh, experts would say that met the domain that satisfied the standards. With the certification, it's still a peer review. It is not a, a job test. It is not a, a knowledge test. There's no, uh, there's no multiple choice questions or anything like that. It is a, a peer review of a portfolio of products. Also, with the certification, they expire. They retire. So you have to recertify periodically. 
and that's usually on a three-year cycle. But anyway, those are the two the major confusions we're hoping to clarify. We're going to talk about a certification. With that, David, I'll turn it back to you. Um, so why why are we doing this? Um, what's the what's, what actually is driving this this process? The the view of the uh, the task force from the IALD is that the architectural lighting design profession is uh, is at a crossroads. Um, we believe that the profession has reached a point in, in, in its existence where a body of knowledge exists for a profession to define itself and to set the standards of, for competency in the field. And we believe that there's a there's a danger that if the profession does not define itself, then others will try and do it for it. Um, as was the case with the, the in, in Texas uh, a couple of years ago. And if the ILD does not spearhead these efforts, at some point there will be another organization or organizations that will seek to do it for it. So the proposed program presents, we believe, a, a unique and time-limited opportunity for the ILD to help guide, some, uh, guide the efforts in defining what architectural life and design is and what constitutes competence in the field. Why do it? What's, what's driving this? Well, um, there's demand from, from uh, consumers, from government agencies, and for other people uh, who want uh, some, some form of due diligence. People want to know uh, a criteria for competency in a professional field. And there's demand from inside, uh, from lighting designers, from practitioners who want to uh, set themselves apart in the marketplace uh, and want a recognition of their competency, a differentiator from, um, from people who are less skilled or um, uh, are uh, acting on the fringes of the profession. <coughs> and then uh, the third point is, as I, as I mentioned on the, the previous slide, you know, there's this risk of uh, licensure or restrictions on, on the practice that's imposed by outside agencies. And, and that uh, Texas situation in 2009 was, uh, was a very real risk and, and had the potential to severely affect the light and design profession in that state, where the legislation was proposed that would mean that uh, only architects uh, and engineers would be, able to, would be qualified to provide uh, professional lighting design. And, to, and strangely, this, this, uh, this proposed legislation would also have applied to, uh, to theatre lighting designers. So the IALD be believes that um, uh, a valid certification process will prevent a repeat of this situation and provide a level of insulation by um, determining a, a recognized level of competence in our, in our, in our profession. So in uh, 2012, August 2012, the task force uh, presented its findings to the board of directors and uh, it made two key recommendations, that, uh, that there should be uh, a certification in architectural lighting design should be established, and that the credentials should, uh, should be global and administered uh, by a commission. Now, the basis of the task force's recommendations for a certification is uh, that it was international, uh, evidence-based, as Judy mentioned, it's not exam or curriculum driven, that it should be performance-based, uh, uh, where um, focused on, on people's competence in, in the field, uh, judged against uh, defined criteria, and it believes that uh, in so doing that uh, legitimacy would be, um, would be given to what is, after all, an emerging profession, particularly in uh, some parts of the world, uh, in order to, uh, to provide the industry with uh, best practice. Now, at the heart of the credential are, um, are areas of expertise or domains of practice. And um, these domains, these, these areas of competency, have been identified as part of the feasibility study and uh, through intensive research. And they've been validated through uh, through global surveys, and, uh, and each domain has clearly defined proficiency requirements. <coughs> and 
here they are. There's seven all together. And uh, these are the areas of expertise which, which form the, the basis of assessment for competency. And what I'm going to do next is go through them uh, one by one and give you just a, a snapshot of, of, of each uh, domain. So the first one is, is all about whether the, the results meet the expectations and the ambitions of the project. Um, and I will I'll read these out as, as we go. Uh, goal number, the, uh, domain number one says, the design of lighting solutions that satisfy the project requirements and the design intent so that the solution performs as expected. The second domain is, is one of collaboration, <coughs> and this is uh, perhaps a, this is a key di differentiator for uh, independent lighting designers uh, um, who, um, uh, uh, rather than um, um, sales representatives, and if, in effect this says, um, did the designer work effectively in the project team uh, to add value to the process? Uh, it's about the integration with other disciplines, proving the integration with other disciplines by serving as an integral member of the team so that lighting relates to the context and adds value to the project. <coughs> Ingenuity is, um, is something that we all pride ourselves on as, as lighting designers, and um, it can perhaps be defined as we've, as we've uh, written here the contribution of ideas that demonstrate innovation, creativity, originality, imagination, or resourcefulness to foster the goals of the project. <coughs> is the design creative, inventive, and resourceful is the, uh, is the core of, uh, of this domain. Um, you know, the, the, the fourth domain, synthesis, is really the um, I think is, is really the core of creating a magical space. It's the seamless integration of the art and science of, um, of light to create a harmonious outcome. And defined as being here the integration of the technical and aesthetic elements of lighting with space and form. Of course, uh, uh, science is, is a big part of uh, light and design. And, um, and uh, demonstrating whether the light designer has used the appropriate technology and scientific methods to solve problems is, uh, is, is a criteria for measurement. And um, defined here as being the demonstration of how light interacts with people, materials, and building systems by applying the principles of light to meet the relevant technical criteria. Stewardship is, uh, uh, is, a, is, a, uh, is a very aspirational and an important uh, criteria. It's about the responsibility uh, beyond duty of care. The, uh, has the designer shown uh, care and leadership on a social and environmental front uh, in their application of light? And um, captured uh, as, uh, in the domain as being the response to known and potential social and environment, environmental impact by designing solutions that avoid or minimize harm, discomfort, or waste. <coughs> and the last domain uh, really is, is, is perhaps the most important one of all. Um, does the design of lighting solutions positively affect people? Um, does it improve the experience? For people and users of the of the space. So now I'm going to move on to the mechanics of of the, uh, the proposed mechanics of the um, credential and how it will work. Well, first thing is you have to be in order to get a credential, you have to pass some. Uh, there's, there's eligibility, and uh, to the two elements, the key elements of, uh, of eligibility are whether you are an architectural lighting design practitioner, and whether you have sufficient experience to meet the, um, the portfolio requirements. Uh, and, um, 
and this experience is, is defined as being four years as a, as a lead designer. Candidates will, will submit a portfolio of work and other evidence, and, um, and they will be, and this portfolio will, 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 uh, will require, will, will demonstrate achievements against uh, the assessment criteria of the, of the domains. Uh, the portfolio will be reviewed in terms of uh, stated performance criteria, and um, the reviewers there will be two reviewers uh, for uh, that, that undertake the, the the assessment process, and they will be trained in the subject matter and experts in the field, and um, and uh, the professional members will. Uh, have the benefit, or professional members of ILD or PLDA will have the benefit of being able to submit fewer examples to demonstrate their competence because it's, it's recognized that um, uh, these people have already uh, um, passed a certain uh, criteria in order to get their professional membership. Um, there will be a board created to, to manage the government, to manage the credential, to govern it. And the board will be made up of representatives from light and design associations, uh, ILD, PLDA, and others. Um, and then there will also be representatives from um, other related organizations, architects, project managers, and the like. The key here is that the governance will be independent, uh, will stand alone. Um, the ILD will initially um, provide the administration and management services, largely through the utilization of, of staff. The business plan that we uh, created in, uh, as, as part of the feasibility process has predicted costs against uh, a number of scenarios. And the credential, um, and it's, what we found is that the, the credential really requires the buy-in from other organizations, but initially, Finances may depend on the ILD, but how, having said all that, the, the financial and administrative independence is a key goal of the credential. And where are we today? Well, <coughs> uh, we're currently uh, uh, conducting an alpha test to uh, to confirm that the the directions of the credential are clear. Other requirements. This is this is trying to uh, trying to, for us trying to prove whether the requirements in the application are legible. Uh, do the applicants understand what what is required of them? Um, and this group of people, uh, select group of people in the alpha group, is a group of people that we 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 chose specifically um, who should have the skills or we believe have the skills and experience to acquire a, a credential. There should, there, there, there should be no uh, possibility of them not being able to, to uh, acquire that. And they're, they're people that are spread across the globe. The next step is uh, a beta test uh, to confirm that the process actually measures proficiency. Um, this is a group, uh, a more diverse group of people, and um, in the, both in their experience and uh, the time they've, they've spent in the profession. So here's the timeline. Um, right now, as I mentioned, we are undertaking the alpha and beta testing, and we'll get some feedback from that. And um, it's probable, possible that um, we will have to make some some adjustments to, depending on, on on what the comments are and what we find. Then uh, later on this year, uh, the, the task force will will undertake this final review and and uh, make a presentation to the ILD board. And it's expected that uh, in 2004 that the program will be launched. So that's, that really is the uh, synopsis of, uh, uh, of the credential investigation and development to date. Um, I'm, uh, there's now an opportunity for, for people to ask questions, and uh, I will uh, together with Judy Hale, I will um, we will try and uh, answer those as, as best we can. But there is also a list of uh, frequently asked questions, and uh, that's available 
uh, via the, the website address that's up on the screen right there, uh, or you can um, contact the ILD office by the phone, and, um, and people will be very pleased to um, very pleased to help you. So I will uh, I will hand the audio to Jennifer Jones, and Jennifer will um, will uh, field the questions. Hello again, everyone. And first of all, thank you, David and Judy, for making yourself available for these presentations. Um, I have a couple of questions from the audience. And as a reminder, you can use the question and answer box on the bottom right-hand side of your screen, and I'll be able to field your questions to the panelists. Um, first question is, how will the ILD define a lead designer? Uh, Jennifer, this is Judy. Uh, the application defines it as someone who is responsible for the conceptualization, development, management, and implementation of the design. David may want to augment that, but that's exactly what it says in our application. Yes, uh, I mean, that, that really captures it. Um, it's somebody who's been uh, pivotal to the, um, to, the, to the whole process, you know, uh, from the beginning through to the end. And, uh, you know, as a senior designer, you, I know that um, you dip in and out at, at stages. Perhaps um, uh, documentation might be a phase where a senior designer uh, um, hands the, 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 uh, the development or the, um, that part of the, of the process to junior designers. But uh, a lead designer is really somebody who has shaped the, the results and has been involved in the process through the beginning and managed it managed um, uh, the outcomes uh, from concept through to delivery. Great. Um, I have a question. If this certification is open to anyone or only ILD members? Uh, it's open to uh, absolutely anybody. Um, it's not a requirement that you're a member of an association. Um, uh, unlike the ILD and PLDA um, uh, memberships, uh, it's not uh, driven by any particular code of ethics. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a measurement of competency and, and, uh, and standard, and so it is open to, uh, to anybody who is a, um, um, derives their living from, uh, from lighting design. Perfect. Um, I have a question about governance here as to who are the others who might be included in ILD, PLDA, and others um, as members of the Commission's governing group? Well, that's, that, that has a little bit of uh, development uh, to go on right now, um, but it's quite possible. We, we would imagine that um, other organizations that would be involved could, could, uh, would include the IES, uh, maybe the, the Asian Association of Lighting Designers, um, CIE. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a quite a range of organisations that would, we would hope would be we would invite to be on the governing board. And then, of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that this governing board would also have um, um, sort of peripheral members as well, or associated organisations. Uh, representatives from architecture, project management, and facility management. Something else we might want to add to that is that uh, the governance board would be more than likely rotating terms. In other words, they're not lifetime assignments. So certain seats would be allocated to different organizations. So David mentioned the Asian lighting group. There's also a Latin American lighting group. There's European. So those, the, the important thing is that the governance uh, offers full representation, allows these critical groups to have a voice in uh, the management of the credential. Okay, I have another question here. Um, it was discussed that there will be a process for presenting your project. Um, to a group that will review your submission. Um, what if you don't have any built projects at the time of your submission? I think that, uh, Judy, do you want to have a go at that? Well, I, I think it would be difficult 
<clears throat> to meet the domains because the domains ask you to show evidence that you met the requirements of the project. The domains ask that you show that uh, you did no harm, okay? So it, that's why in our definition of the lead designer, it went all the way from uh, conceptualization to implementation. So I would say if you don't have any built projects, you're on your way. I would, <clears throat> when we're ready, I would ask you to still look at the application. It'll be uh, it, when, when we're ready, it'll be downloadable. It'll be free. The domains are free. Look at that and have it guide your work in the future. But it is for people who have actually seen work executed, if you will, brought to fruition. Yes, because the first domain is is demonstrating that the the goals have met the uh, met the outcome and goals and outcomes have met the uh, the um, the expectations. Okay, yes, another so. question here. Um, are we still looking for beta testing participants? You betcha. Yes, 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 yes. Um, yes, and if anyone um, who is an attendee on this call is interested in helping out with the beta test, we are still looking for people to help us tailor our assessment process to ensure we're looking at the right level of, um, of proficiency in lighting design. So please shoot us an email over to credentialingandild.org. That email address is on your screen. And we'll begin the beta process at the end of July. Yes, we're looking for a, a, a very diverse group of people. So um, uh, whilst, the, whilst the credential is aimed at, um, uh, ha has uh, an eligibility, uh, has established an eligibility level, um, in terms of the beta test, we, that doesn't apply. We're looking for people with you know, two, three, four, five, six, seven onwards years experience and um, so that we can see that, that range of experience and how it, uh, how it works with the credential as, as we've developed to date. Fantastic. We have a lot of questions um, in the queue now and we're going to try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, the next question is, how does certification ensure that states will not enact requirements for licensure? Uh, Judy, I'll that's, take that, that one. That's, yeah, I'll, that's one for you. I'll take that. Generally speaking, uh, federal groups prefer certification over licensure. Licensure is an economic burden for them. So uh, our goal is not to pursue licensure because we don't want it as restrictive. You should also know that certifications are almost usually more rigorous than licensure. Licensure, by definition, is minimum competence. Okay? So, and that's why most licensure is only on a knowledge test. So, uh, certainly in the United States, the states uh, far prefer certification over licensure. So, I've, I've not seen... Uh, government agencies take on licensure when there is a solid credential in place. Okay, a uh, question on recertification. What do you envision the frequency would be that recertification will need to take place? Um, Where do Go ahead, David. I was just, okay, I, I, what we've discussed uh, to date, I think this is fairly typical, is that um, uh, there'd be a reassessment or recertification um, for the individuals on a, on a sort of a, uh, probably a three-year basis. Is that correct, Judy? So that we're, they typically run three to five years. Okay, so I see this about the same time, and we will be discussing if that's going to be based on continuing education, or is it going to be based on some uh, subset of the domains, uh, uh, another demonstration, but. Uh, quite honestly, the jury's still out on that, so we're still working through that. <coughs> okay. Um, is the idea of the program to have a requirement for lighting design to be done by, um, the person here is asking, by an IALD and, let's just say, a certified lighting designer on every project similar to a PE or an AIA? Well, this is this is a, a voluntary process. It's a it's a it's a process which um, is designed really to cr 
demonstrate a, um, uh, a measure of competencies uh, so that uh, there's, a, there's a, a measurement by which people can sort of show their, their expertise. Um, <coughs> uh, currently we have, uh, you know, we, we use uh, our experience, our track record uh, as, as, as that, and that of course would still apply. But this is really uh, uh, looking forward uh, and, and trying to create a, a recognized level of competency for, um, uh, for people to promote their work and promote their, their abilities. Uh, in, in a way that sort of stacks up against their uh, uh, stacks up against a particular defined uh, criteria. So it's not intended specifically to try and make sure there's a, uh, a certified lighting designer on every project. This is really for the individuals to uh, uh, to present their credentials, their ability, and also to try and head off this uh, this potential that we've we've, we've noted as being. Um, uh, a risk from legislators in the future. Do you want to add anything to that, Judy? Yes. However, I will say to you that if, in time, it'll take a while, that assuming this credential is actually implemented and launched and it does well, uh, consumers, you would know them as building owners, architects, etc., may in fact start specifying that they would prefer a certified uh, designer on the project. But that takes time to earn. But, uh, but, but again, it's voluntary, yes. I have another question here involving risk and liability. Do you think that certification might result in an increased, um, in increased insurances and liability to lighting designers? Typically speaking, from other uh, professions, uh, certification has no impact at all on your uh, liability or insurance. In fact, many sometimes insurers prefer people who are certified, okay, because they feel like you've at least gone through some peer review. But please understand, people who are certified are still afforded the right to be stupid. In other words, certification doesn't guarantee that someone will not go out and make bad decisions. What it does is it says they're capable of making good decisions. But generally speaking, certification has zero impact on liability that way. Uh, if anything, it has a positive because insurers like it and it does not increase your liability or your fees. Thanks, Judy. Um, I have a question here about who would be eligible for the certification. Is this only for lighting designers or could it be for a lighting design studio? This, this is for lighting designers. It's, it's a measurement of, of um, people's ability, individuals' ability. Some, a, a studio would be like an accreditation where we're going and accredit that studio. So David is right. This certification is for individuals who may be employed at a studio. Okay. I have a couple of questions here about um, differentiating this um, certification from the NCQLP and their lighting certified certification. What are okay. the differences? All right. Well, I um, the NCQLP I thought would would come up. It's it's uh, it's a U.S. centric um, uh, um, credential, and um, the, the 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 point of of what we're doing is the point of this credential is that it's. Um, it's to, uh, it's to uh, recognize a higher level of design competency. It's not a, it's not a question and answer. It's, um, it's something much more in, uh, uh, comprehensive and broader, and it's, uh, mm -hmm. and it's based on design, not on, on meeting sort of, uh, um, not just on, um, on the technical side of, uh, of lighting. So it's, it's, a much, it's a much higher standard. Let's see. Um, would the certification be issued by the IALD or by a governing body? It would actually be offered by a separate entity. Uh, uh, IALD, as David said, would be administering, would be providing administrative support. But the goal is to create a separate entity. The name has not been created yet, but it'll be named. And, so it'll be, and that that body would be the group that bestows the credential. 
not IALD, nor would it be PLDA. Okay, and an another question about um, review and comment. Will existing voting members of the IALD or PLDA, for example, have a chance to review and comment on the certification process and criteria once the beta has started? Judy, do you want to, what's the? What's well, that's, the, I think that they have had, we've been trying very hard to incorporate uh, that voice, but there's nothing preventing anyone from making a comment or adding or, or uh, so the, uh, those comments are always open, but this is partially why we do these webinars, David and I. This is why we spoke at uh, Light Fair, uh, things like that. We're trying to provide uh, IALD and PLDA opportunities to provide input throughout. Uh, we don't have a formal process of having them go out and vote, if that's what you mean, that, uh, at least not that I know about. But that doesn't mean that your uh, governing your board of directors might elect to do something like that. But right now, that's not the plan. There's no plan to go out and do a formal vote among the membership to answer your question. Unless, uh, Jen and David, you know something that I don't know. No, that's right. And, and I, would, uh, I would say if somebody, if people do want to have, uh, um, exercise some influence uh, beyond what we've, uh, the opportunities we've given to date, I think that um, uh, participating in the beta group would be very useful we'd certainly enjoy that feedback. I think that's an, um, an excellent suggestion. Um, we've gone forth with a number of surveys of architectural lighting designers, others in the design build industry to verify our work that we've done thus far, and have hosted a number of open forums. I think the best opportunity at this point is participating in the beta or communicating with us via the credentialing at ILD.org email address so we can kind of know some concerns that um, are coming from your side. The process of um, the process we're going through now, the well, just finish the alpha and, and going forward with the beta testing, is really uh, for us. You know, we're still listening. Uh, we, we're uh, not only are we sort of testing that the the credential sort of is a is a, is a good measurement as, as predicted, and that the instructions are uh, understandable and legible. But also, it's, a, it's another it's another opportunity for us to get feedback. So we um, so if you would like to participate, that would be uh, we, we'd like to encourage that. Absolutely. Um, another question here about recertification. What do you see as the, the process for recertification? Does it involve continuing education or resubmitting projects? Judy, uh, um, you, you know a bit more about this. Well, that, that is, I would say, that that's open. Uh, there are trade-offs on both of that. Uh, most recertifications, uh, they're called maintenance, and they encourage you to participate in continuing education. And what they're doing there is they're trying to uh, encourage or incent practitioners to stay current, and that might be new technological developments, that might be, due, uh, David talked about the stewardship domain, that might be around ergonomic or uh, hazardous waste, or, or maybe there's new research on the impact on light, on productivity and health. It would be those things. So, so the benefit of continuing ed is to encourage or incent practitioners to stay current and up to date as science advances, technologies advances, and our understanding of human humans advances. There's also a side. Well, maybe we need to continue to prove that we're competent, and then then we would be asking for a review. So, but in all fairness. Uh, we are so concentrated on getting the first part and our standards. We have not, we've uh, talked about it, but no decision has been finalized on how to do the recertification. Yeah, and just as an adjunct to that, um, you know, not only will there be um, recertification to make sure that people's skills and abilities are, are current with the way technology and, and, um, and design and the profession advances, 
but also it's recognised that the credential itself is dynamic. Uh, there are things in the we, we fully expect that uh, the measurements that we we use today will be uh, slightly different, perhaps in five or ten years' time. So there needs to be a process to to make sure that the uh, the credential assessment itself is is live. What kind of outreach have we done thus far to other design build organizations such as the AIA, USGBC, IIDA, um, REBA, for example, in the UK? Um, so other design build organizations and other organizations within the lighting design community. Well, the, the questionnaire, <coughs> we've, we've had uh, a questionnaire, um, in fact, a couple that uh, were, were sent out to organizations for, distribu for distribution to their members, and, uh, and that we had uh, 637 respondents. Uh, and so we had very good feedback from a very broad field from 36 countries. And there's also been uh, representations in, in a number of countries, uh, design and build. Here in Australia, we made representations. There's been representations uh, at a personal level uh, um, uh, by, by board members across the globe, so the, it's been a uh, it's been a, a, an inclusive and uh, uh, an expansive process to try and engage with uh, as many organisations as people as possible. Great. Let's see. Um, is there an estimated cost range for the cost of the propose, proposed certification? And would this be required to be paid every three years? I'm assuming from the app, the certificates. Uh, yes, usually there is a recertification fee, and that's periodic. We have no idea what it is. And in terms of this uh, credential, I don't think we have quite resolved that. We are we're trying to make sure it's cost competitive and uh, not overly burdensome. Uh, but uh, I don't believe we have the the the, uh, the the board of directors has to once they want to go with it so uh, we I unless again Jim you might know something but I'm not seeing a number we we haven't come to um, any numbers yet we're still just kind of finalizing the actual assessment process and application process and um, we're gonna have to do some more due diligence to research prices and um, what would be acceptable for the certification in particular. Okay, next question. Um, this person says, I would expect that there'd be quite a large number of applications when this process is launched. Thank you, Matt, I hope so too. Um, can the governing body commit to awarding certification to all qualified candidates who apply in a short period of time? Well, this, <coughs> we, we've sort of, the business model has made some predictions, but we, um, you know, it's very hard for us to, to have, uh, to know whether our predictions are accurate in, in um, so we're really going to have to sort of uh, find a way uh, through this to some degree. <clears throat> but we're, we're conscious of um, the fact that uh, as, we, as we go through, the feedback we're getting is very positive, and we're conscious that uh, this will be will be appealing to a great number of people. And so will will um, the people who will be trained to to examine it will be we, we trust um, that we'll have resources there to to do that. But um, I have to have to be frank with you that you know it's a little bit of an unknown right now. <clears throat> you know whether we get uh, 50 or 100 or 200 people in the first uh, period to who ask for uh, ask to apply. Uh, we 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 can't really we don't have a crystal ball that gives us uh, a precise answer there. But what we thought about in terms of managing that process is that the um, uh, uh, the credential will will be uh, assessed on a periodic basis, so it won't be continuous. So in a, um, uh, potentially in a four month period, uh, uh, submissions will be collected and the end of that four month period, there will be then a, perhaps a four month period for the assessments. So we will get a very good sense of, 
uh, of, of whether we, uh, of, of the resources we need to, to manage this process based on what's coming in through four months and then we have four months to deal with that and then the following four months there will be another, the, the, the assessments will be collected and, and assessed again. So that's the way we're, this, this kind of rolling periodic uh, assessment process is the way we're, we're uh, proposing to, uh, to deal with that. Judy, anything to add there? No, I think that's, uh, again, we do not have a crystal ball. We hope that we're begging for mercy because we have so many, but uh, we'll see what happens. Great. Um, what do we think the, the timeline is to impl implement the certification if all goes well? Well, we're, we're hoping, um, uh, we're, we're, we're aiming for next year. Um, I can't be precise about when a, when is next year, I'd, but I, I would have thought you know a year from now is 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 reasonable. Somewhere between you know somewhere maybe mid year um, next year would be uh, a reasonable expectation. Let's see this question: Will demonstration of technical competence, such as LC lighting certified, be a component of the certification review, such as might be defined under domain item number five, science? Um, if I understand the question uh, correctly, the, the, the fact we have uh, an LC uh, won't won't uh, won't necessarily mean that you you, you automatically uh, pass that uh, uh, that level that that measurement uh, for that domain, but certainly if you have an LC and uh, then you obviously have a, a good understanding of uh, the technical application and the, the the principles of lighting, and it will help you. But uh, in itself, the uh, the reference to LC won't uh, won't provide an advantage uh, in that particular area. All right, I have a question from an emerging professional. ILD has always been welcoming to emerging professionals such as junior designers. How will the certification process incorporate them? It seems that this is for lead or senior designers. Judy, could you could you talk to that because that that really sort of um, you know, there's, there's education and 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 uh, development, and this is quite a uh, quite a sort of a, a big topic, isn't it? Certainly, I'd be happy to take it on. Uh, yes, this is for experienced designers. How it affects that emerging professional is that these standards, uh, the domains, if you were to study them and look at what is being used as evidence, should help guide and direct your professional development. You should be looking at projects that allow you to demonstrate it. You should be uh, pursuing either working under people who you can learn from that help enhance your skills in these areas. So, so the domains are certainly meant to be developmental for emerging professionals. However, uh, emerging professionals, by definition, uh, are not eligible to pursue the credential as in apply for it but they can certainly use the domains to guide their own development. And I would encourage you to do that. So some specifics about um, the measurement of the domains. How would a concept like collaboration, for example, be measured through a portfolio review? It's actually measured through attestations from your uh, customers, clients, and other people. So you have to have somebody attest related to your collaboration. So you correct the portfolio review, a, a, a photograph, for example, a schematic does not provide evidence of collaboration. So that is measured differently, if you will. And the, the other thing here is that the, uh, uh, not, it's not just portfolio, Submission. It's also there is a, a requirement for people to uh, to explain with uh, in, in written format how they've uh, met these various the, the criteria for these uh, domains. So, for instance, you know, in collaboration, you, 
we have 300 words to to say, to explain uh, who you collaborated with on the project. Um, you then there's a question about how how did you collaborate uh, and and to derive the design. Uh, you're then asked uh, another question to explain how the design uh, related the context and and how um, the collaboration added uh, added value to the to the process. And um, for each of those questions, then you you are invited to submit exhibits that uh, that support your written text. So uh, you know it's 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 pictures and words, and um, there's lots of opportunity there for people to. Um, uh, to to uh, express how this happened. Okay, next question. Pardon me. Um, what are some other examples of professions that might be certified and not necessarily licensed? Well, I can, I can answer that just from my, um, my own experience. I am a certified association executive, so I hold a certification, but not a license. Project managers are not licensed. Uh, performance technologists are not licensed. Um, facility managers are not licensed. Okay. Uh, so... There are a number of them that, that are not like uh, uh, professions that are not licensed. People who work in school improvement are not licensed. They are certified, but they're not. But they're not licensed. I, I think that uh, just to sort of um, add on to that is you know, the, the intent of this credential is to avoid licensing. That's something we absolutely don't want. Uh, that's a, a, a path of fragmentation because licensing, um, uh, you know, can, there's no no way that a license can apply to on, on, on a global scale. A license would apply to individual states, um, to individual countries, maybe even sort of be, maybe even municipalities for uh, for that matter. Uh, and we don't want to have a license imposed upon us um, because that's restrictive and. Um, and as Judy mentioned earlier in the presentation, you know, it's a base level of, of measurement, and th this aspires to, to be much greater than that. All right. Um, the U.S. General Services Administration requires an LC certified lighting professional on each project. Will there be an effort to lobby the GSA to change this requirement to this new proposed certification? We, we recognize that um, uh, part of the, this next year, uh, having established, the, the, having sort of um, got the mechanics of the credential and, and, and defined the credential and refined it into something that's, that's workable and, and, uh, and uh, provides the level of measurement that we want, having done that, the, 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 there's a very significant amount of effort that needs to go into marketing and promoting this. And uh, our expectation is that when, when it... Uh, uh, when it gets traction and uh, and uh, a level of acceptance, then that will uh, that will provide it with some some currency, which will uh, hopefully uh, get incorporated into into uh, project briefs and and requirements for lighting designers on projects. Okay. Um would a certified lighting designer be allowed to maintain their certification if they didn't work as a lighting designer for a few years, for example, for family or economic reasons, or would they have to start over? I, I can take that on. That's what we call an exception, and that's why you have a governing body. And one would simply submit, we call it an appeal, uh, to say, because of personal circumstances, they could be rearing children or illness or caring for elders or whatever, uh, you would like a waiver and, and, and you would like that. You'd still probably have to meet your recertification requirements and uh, you would like a waiver, if you will, and most, credit, most certifications allow for that. So it's not meant to punish people because they 
step out of their profession for other reasons for a period of time? So the answer is, I would say yes, but it, there's going to be what we call uh, an appeals and an exemption process built in. Can a manufacturer's rep or distributor be certified under this new program? Well, this is this. There's been a lot of debate about this, and um, but the reality, the, the the conclusion that the task force came to, <coughs> and you have to recognise that the task force was made up of of uh, members of um, PLDA and ILD, so um, uh, not manufacturers. Uh, but ultimately, the the task force came to the conclusion that if you are a good designer and you can demonstrate that you have you you uh, are competent in all the seven domains, then you're a good designer and you should be able to be certified to uh, in, in recognition of that. But having said that, uh, the domains is satis for, for a, a lighting rep uh, who is an excellent designer for them to be able to demonstrate. Um, uh, to, to satisfy all the seven domains will be quite hard because of the, the integration with the process, which often reps don't have. They're often involved in, uh, sporadically in, in, in the process. You know, they come in perhaps to at the beginning with a, a few samples, and then they're sort of involved in perhaps the specification stage by submitting their, their products to, to meet the designer's criteria. But this this uh, the, the credential requires uh, evidence that the the designer has been in, engaged with the process all the way through. So it will be quite hard for a, uh, a sales representative to be able to meet all the criteria that that, that, that defined in the um, in, in the certification analysis. But in theory, it's possible. Uh, as I said, if you if you are a good designer, you're an exceptional designer, and you can can show your skills uh, in each of those areas of competency, then uh, then you will be able to acquire uh, a credential. Um, a question about requirements. If you're a professional ILD member, will you have to submit to get your re to get your certification? As it seems the requirements are very similar. You, you will have to, if you're a professional um, member of ILD or PLDA, um, you will have to submit uh, um, just like everybody else. However, the requirements are slightly different, which you know, if you would like to be part of the, um, uh, the beta test, that would be, you know, you'd, we would be able to sort of, uh, you'd be able to see that. But um, the requirements are slightly different insofar as the, the test requires um, the the applicant to submit uh, a number of a minimum number of projects to demonstrate their competency across each of those domains, and for the for the professional uh, member, the submission requirements are are, are less. So you, you you're able you're able to submit less projects to demonstrate uh, your abilities. So it, it you are given a level of assistance uh, in recognition of the the fact that. Having got a professional, having been accepted as a professional member, then um, you already have a, a high level of achievement. As a follow-up to that, how many projects might an applicant have to have submitted as part of the the peer review process? The way it's set out is that if you are not a professional member, <clears throat> you must demonstrate competence in all seven domains two times. Now, you have. You can submit multiple projects to do that. Uh, we're assuming it's going to be a reasonable number, like three to five projects to demonstrate all seven domains. Uh, a professional member need only demonstrate competence one time in each of the seven. And that professional members can submit one, two projects to do that. Um, another question here. Um, are we considering grandfathering for designers that have been working in the field for 10, 15, or 20 years? We are considering it. We've, we've sort of parked that because it's, um, uh, it's not critical to, to this immediate path that we've been going down. 
but it is something that we we're going to consider in the in, in the next few months. Will the projects that are submitted have to be new construction, or um, can it be any project which involves new lighting design being placed within an existing space or building? So retrofits, I'm thinking. I, I think that uh, yes, it could it could be retrofits. Um, uh, I, I think that certainly, if you look at those, if you look at the seven domains, let's just go on to that that slide. If you look at the the seven domains, you know, certainly you know uh, a number of those. You know, collaboration. Well, that's 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 not specific to a new build. Not as goals or outcomes. Uh, yeah, you can be ingenious and clever and resourceful with a retrofit. Um, the synthesis of uh, uh, art and science, um, uh, collaboration and and such uh, is not specific to to new build. Some, I mean, my uh, my my comment to that is that. Uh, the the material that you submit does not have to be new build. I think uh, most of those domains, if not all of them, can can be demonstrated by um, uh, retrofit. But obviously, you know, it, it, there's a scale to this. Um, you know, it has you would have to be able to answer the questions and uh, and support your your comment with, uh, with with documentation that shows that the retrofit ha had substance to demonstrate. Uh, um, satisfaction of those those seven domains. Do you think that the establishment of this certification would make ILD professional membership less appealing or unnecessary? Well, this um, this has come up before. We, I think, it's likely to to change um, some aspects. It's uh, I think it's going to put a focus on uh, on education for professions. I mean, uh, uh, professional uh, associations will uh, will provide a very useful and very important part of the ed the continuing education program. Um, Judy, do you want to talk a little bit about how this has happened uh, with other organisations? What what uh, what uh, changes are uh, you know, come about as a result of um, credential and how that affects professional associations? Certainly. In, in this particular case, uh, both with IALD and PLDA, uh, the, the fact that their professional membership requirement is to be independent, okay, that just serves another need. And, and, and we think in, uh, the combination will be very powerful. So I, I'm expecting it to be a, a, a positive thing, not to diminish the professional membership, but the professional membership also measures is, is has this business uh, concept, your your business model. So it's not going to be open to everybody. But our feeling is that it, the two will be very complementary and actually could strengthen one's competitive or market position. All right, we have a couple more questions here, and then we will wrap up the session. Thank you everyone for staying with us for a little bit longer than an hour. We wanted to make sure that we could answer all of your questions. Um, this question is, would any experience credit be given to someone with an advanced lighting education, i.e. Parsons um, Masters in Fine Arts Lighting Design, MFALD? So, um, I think that uh, having a, um, an advanced um, uh, Qualification in in those fields is will be very useful. Will it will um, certainly put people in good stead for for achieving a, uh, a credential. But in itself, uh, having an education qualification or, or having reached a certain uh, attained a certain level of um, through education does not specifically um, uh, change the outcome with respect to. Um, Satisfying the seven domains and de demonstrating your competency against that uh, that criteria measurement. Judy, have you thoughts on that? No, I would agree. I would think that uh, that degree, uh, those particular degrees, should just make it easier for you to demonstrate the domains. But it's but the degree itself will not give you extra points. And the final question. Um, 
maybe some wishful thinking on some people's part. If you receive this certification, does it mean that you'll be accepted as a professional member to the IELD? <laughs> um, no, they, they are they are independent, um, uh, and and of course, uh, um, IELD and PLDA have uh, a particular code of ethics, um, so you would uh, you would have to sort of. Uh, adhere to those code of ethics in order to to become a professional member. So the two are, are, are not related. Um, but having, you know, I assuming you're an independent lighting designer and you have a credential, um, then your your portfolio would be presumed to be pretty useful uh, in in terms of your application for a, a member membership, uh, professional membership of, of those organisations. Okay, well, that will wrap up our session for this afternoon. Thank you so much for to Judy and David for participating. If you have any further questions, please be sure to send us an email to credentialing at ILD.org, and we'll be able to get back to you with um, individual answers. Also, if you're interested in participating in the beta test that will begin at the end of July, also please shoot us an email, and um, we'd be happy to include you in that outreach. David, any last remarks? No, I'd just like to thank everybody for, for participating. And um, we've had a lot of people uh, listening in today, and that's been really encouraging. And um, we welcome your, your comments, your feedback. And um, you know, this, this process has been uh, one of one where we've, we've wanted to in, uh, uh, reflect that um, what people want, and and, um, and uh, it's been a listening process as much as anything else, and that listening process continues, and um, so we, we're keen to hear any further views that you might have. So please get in touch with us via the email that's on the screen right now uh, if you want to add anything to, um, to comments through this webinar or you have any further thoughts. I'd like to thank you very much for engaging with us. Thank you. Uh, Jen, this is Judy. I want to thank the people who have already signed up to help participate in the beta test. So I've got your names down, and you will be hearing from me uh, sometime tomorrow. Thank you.